welcome back to AFP. I am very excited to bring on someone outside of our usual suspects. Uh, center back for FC Dallas, Nkosi Tafari, playing phenomenal so far over the course of the season. Um, Nkosi, thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thank you for having me. I uh, love the opportunity and getting a chance to meet some new people, talk about some different things. So let's start with this weekend. Uh, we've heard this buildup for this Texas rivalry for about three, four years now as Austin's come online. Obviously, the Houston-Dallas rivalry has a ton of history now. But this was your first, I guess we're calling it Copa Tejas. You can correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not a Texas guy. But uh, what was <laughs> what was the buildup like? What was the experience like? Um, the buildup was, it was interesting. It was the first of anything. So as it was unfolding, it was... Uh, just new for everybody but the experience was pretty good Austin had a decent bit of fans there obviously they wanted to show out to a certain extent within the first game of uh, I guess this air quotes rivalry I'm not sure how it is a rivalry since it is the very first game (laughs) Um, I don't really know how that makes sense but you know if the fans are saying it's a rivalry sure go ahead I try and win every game regardless but if they want some extra bragging rights I'm all for it did anyone try and explain, is there a rivalry between Dallas and Austin as cities? Did anyone try and fill you in? Uh, you are, for people that don't know, a New York native, got drafted by FC Dallas last year. So you're still dipping your toes into Texas culture in general. Yeah, it, I, I think they just wanted a little bit extra to, uh, some some extra to go after. There's another team mm-hmm. in Texas and that seemed to just uh, be it. They were just like, well, we're we're going to be the best team in Texas. We want to be better than FC Dallas. We want to be better than Houston. And since we're another team and win the MLS, then it's a rivalry, um, which is what seemed to be the case. But I feel like since there's three of us, it's more of like a round robin rivalry type of a thing. It's like, I feel like you got to win the entirety of the games to, to crown yourself as the king of Texas. Okay. So we're not there yet, which means you're leaving, you're leaving some pressure out there for Dallas in general. Um, You mentioned those fans that came for Austin. You've obviously not been able to play in a normal atmosphere most of your two years because of COVID and what's been going on. But what did you make of the energy in the stadium for this game compared to the other ones you've experienced? Uh, It was good. It was definitely good. I think we've had a good showing in terms of a a fan standpoint for most of the season uh, since we've been back. Um, playing about two games a week since around June 19th. Um, Most of the games, we had a a game earlier against Houston this year as well. And I still think the atmosphere has gotten better, even against Mm -hmm. teams that aren't our rivals. Um, I think the fans have just had a little bit more energy. And since we're performing better, it's something that they want to come out to. They want to watch, they want to cheer. And our supporter section is big time. They always, they always show up. So you mentioned that turnaround undefeated in the last four, three of those are wins. You've moved from basically the bottom of the Western Conference to striking distance of the playoffs. Um, what do you make of what this turnaround, what's caused this turnaround? Uh, I think when when we were at just the bottom, like strictly rock bottom, and uh, I think we were genuinely 13th uh, into the conference, We there's a lot of things that you can pick on. There's many, many tiny, tiny details because it's not necessarily the norm. For all of us, a lot of guys have come from different backgrounds, winning championships, maybe different experiences. As you know, we have players like Matt Hedges, Jimmy Maurer, uh, Ryan Hollingshead, guys that have been in America and playing in MLS for close to 10 years. First, some guys who have been playing in Spain and have won things and lost things. So it was kind of communicating, seeing what uh, the issues are within the team and being honest with ourselves and then just tackling them one by one. Like for a great stretch of games, we had uh, a huge lack of energy in terms of just defending set pieces. Mm-hmm. And I think we were letting up maybe like five goals in like six games. Um, that's something you have to look at considering it's not the norm. And then, yeah, just communicating with ourselves and being honest in terms of like, we have to change something up, apply more energy, all the above. Um, so then we started doing a lot of these things and getting the first road win um, in Kansas City, albeit not a pretty game to where it was 600 passes, uh three balls, play it down the line, cross it in, whatever, most beautiful goals, even though they were actually beautiful goals. <laughs> um, we had to sit in a low block for a lot of that game and endure a lot of pressure. But, I mean, yeah, you're going into SKC, the, the cauldron, the blue hell, 
um, whatever they're calling it. They got a lot of energy. They hadn't lost 11 in a row at home. Um, so that was huge to get a win, certainly. And then we carried that momentum over into Seattle. Um, the same this past weekend in Austin. We're hoping to just keep doing the same again against SKC in Seattle. They're definitely going to be looking to steal some points back. You mentioned those two big games, the road victory and draw with, with KC in Seattle. For you, as a young player, I mean, those are as big of environments as exist right now in American soccer, uh, North American soccer, whatever you want to call it. What's the what's the experience? What's the preparation like going into those big moments? Yeah, I can I can say I I've been actually thinking about this a lot more recently. I in, in college I never really knew if I liked home games or away games more. I always liked yeah. home games more in college, only for the fact that we had uh, we had the best fans when I was in Connecticut. We had the most fans. It was around like four thousand four hundred. So I always wanted to play in front of a lot of people. Um, but some other stadiums just have larger stadium so they have bigger crowds like 30,000 40,000 Seattle Stadium can hold I think like 60 or something yeah um so I love playing on the away games and feeling a different different atmosphere than our own um but coming home it's like even to this point right now we are undefeated at home we want to keep that record we even I think it was coming in from a few games last season we have a bunch of ties of course but uh we don't want to lose at home that's that's our fortress but the away games for me I really get up for it. Like it's all odds stacked against you. I love the crowd. I love people screaming in my face, the <laughs> adversity. It's uh, it's actually just a beautiful thing. Like I love it. Um, so I really do enjoy away games. That's why if, a, if a, yeah, like an SKC, a Seattle, a Portland, and mm-hmm. LAFC, I think maybe like those four were my favorite atmospheres this year to, to play. And LAFC was actually very intense. Their, their fan section does very well. I, I've told people this, but I, I've been at LAFC games with people who are from overseas who you see that fan section just bouncing on its own. And yeah. they look at you oh, and they're like, yeah. this isn't like emulating Europe. This is like unique. This in itself, it's pretty special. Yeah, that um, that was like one of my favorite parts. We we're It was the first half. We're like building out of a low block. Um, and you just you just see the crowd jumping, moving, and just like intertwining in lines. The, how they do it is so cool. Um, it definitely catches your eye if, if you're not paying attention. And they're they're so loud, sold out. And it's almost built inwards to where they keep the sound in very well, too. It's a great stadium. Yeah, it's pretty impressive what they've done. Um, obviously, your play has been huge to this team's turnaround. Uh, Queen Yon as well has been key defensively in midfield. But people like talking about attackers, so I got to ask you. The young front four that we've seen the last few games uh, with Pepe leading the point and, and Sean and Paxton and Jesus behind them. What's it like to watch them work and how has it maybe changed your team with those four running up top? Yeah, I think with the youth, it's not um, in terms of an attack. It's, it's OK to have the youth. It's sometimes even better because they're more exciting. They're more willing to take risks and just go for something crazy. I say the youth as if I'm <laughs> virtually ancient, but in terms of an attacking perspective, some of these kids, Pepe's 18. So he makes me feel old sometimes. Back in your day, um, but yeah, you walked just, uphill both ways. Yeah, that, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, but yeah, playing with these kids, it's, um, it's great. I, I love playing with Paxton, uh, not to even put a favorite on anything, but he might be my favorite, the way he runs with the ball. Mm. Um, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if this guy's about to get out of this. I'm getting ready to get in prevention because he might lose it. And then he somehow wiggles the three guys and plays a perfect pass, uh, like a <laughs> line splitting pass to like Shun or something crazy. I'm like, wow, this guy does it again. Um, but yeah, Shun, he's bringing a different type of energy. He's been playing out of his mind recently. Um, and normally you'll see left-footed, like out-and-out wingers play just on the right side. Right. But he's doing very well uh, in doing it uh, on the left side. And same for Paxton. He normally plays as an eight. Normally just kind of you'll see him in the middle of the field and maybe he drifts wide, but he's not normally staying wide. But he's doing a great job with handling that. And then Jesus and Pepe, they're just a, a natural duo. They, uh, they know how to find each other well. They feed off of each other well. You know, they're great friends off the field, so it definitely helps what goes on on the field. And then the further you track back, we just got to do our business, keep the shutouts and – Hopefully get some more wins. I got to ask you, you, I assume, go up against Pepe every once in a while in practice. There's a lot of excitement around this guy. I've seen him play for four years now, which shows you how young he was okay. when he started doing great things. Um, what makes him tough? What makes him successful? Um, I say one of his biggest is he has a very good 
eye for goal. His mm-hmm. his ability to finish in and around the box is um it's very it's clean, it's sharp. And if you're not aware, like you will get punished. Like any good nine, that's normally what you hear about a good nine that they have a great eye for goal. And if you fall asleep for a second, they'll punish you. Um, and even he like he'll get his shots off to where you might not think he's going to score like his third goal at a uh, galaxy. Mm-hmm. He's like half turn facing the sideline, but just gets a shot off swings. Go ball goes through the, the center back's legs and then goalie just gets a, a hand on it, but still goes in goals like that. It's like, is it the prettiest thing? No, but he just scored his third goal of the game and he's 18 years old uh, and it went over the line. It's a goal. There's nothing else to it. So it's, he's not scoring the absolute screamers like a Steven Gerrard, but they all count just the same as one. Um, so he's very good in that that aspect. My co-host is a Liverpool fan, so he'll appreciate the Gerrard reference. The pull out of nowhere. Oh, of course. <laughs> on of that course. one. On that one. Um, I wanted to ask for you. You know, I, I've seen interviews with you, talking to you now. You're level-headed. You don't seem to panic. But have you had like an aha moment or like a welcome to the show type moment of just realizing – over the last 18 months, what's happened and where you've come? Uh, yeah, I remember where I was when I first got here and what I what I wanted at the time. It was, I flew out here January 17th. We started on the 21st. Um, and I remember it took a, a while for me, even after I had signed to get up to speed. But I remember in preseason, a lot of things were moving too fast. And I was trying to add up some of my college concepts but only the the good tendencies while also trying to cut out the bad ones, things that like uh, maybe like not picking up your head until you get the ball or not assessing your options until afterwards, certain the case. But it, a lot of things were just moving way too fast. Um, and then I remember getting up to speed probably about maybe three months in when, when the summer hit. But I wasn't like ready to start. I was mm. just like up to the speed of play while still making mistakes, just not like, okay, this guy's just not ready for the level. You're like, okay, no, nah, he just needs to refine his talent. Um, and then once I started getting better at that, um, it was like, all right, just improve my craft from here on out. Um, do the small things. I don't have to do anything crazy. Uh, they would actually prefer I don't. Doing step overs out the back is certainly not my uh, expertise. But yeah, just doing my due diligence. There's a really good staff around us that wants to see just the team succeed and all of us as a whole. So they put me in a good position and I kind of just listen to them. There's a lot of uh, good knowledge in, in older guys that are there with Matt Hedges. Um, I mean, he's got 10 years experience in the league. He's the most capped player in our team, uh, in club history. And then even our assistant coach, um, Peter Lucine, who has quite the track record of winning <laughs> La Liga or yeah. captaining different clubs. Or, yeah, So he's um, he's been a huge help in my kind of ascension over the last year or so. Yeah. I would say. For you now, you've established yourself. You are a starter in in just in year two, your first year of playing in MLS, which is a huge step for a draft pick. If we were to come into your apartment and look at the list, do you have goals? Do you have milestones? Do you have a big picture goal of, of where this all wants to end? Like, how do you look at the future as a, as you know, as a player still finding your feet in the pro game? Yeah, I definitely have goals. Um, I set, I have like one major long-term goal. I had two. It was one was become a professional soccer player. Another was playing a world cup. Um, I couldn't obviously achieve the second without the first. So that was like kind of my my first goal. Um, And then I have this like goals and steps along the way to help me get to where I need to along in maybe five years, six years, whatever down the line. Um, So I eventually do want to play in Europe uh, and certainly in one of the top five divisions across the world, just to, just to know that I can, not for anybody else, just to prove to myself, it's like, how good can I be? Can I, okay. There's always a saying of like in, well, just an American soccer of like, okay, anyone can get drafted but can you earn the contract and can you play Can right. you earn a spot? Can you be a, a stronghold name in the league? It's like, okay, I've, I'd like to do that equivalent, but not, okay. Not just get bought by a team in Europe and then end up coming back to America because I couldn't make it. I want to actually establish my name across different countries and leagues um, and eventually play in a world cup. But while I'm here in the MLS, I'd love to actually win 
uh, and MLS Cup for sure. That would be uh, one of my goals for myself and some of the older guys that hadn't had the chance to. Yeah, I know it would mean a lot to that franchise and a lot to the fan base there. You talked about those goals, getting to the national team, all of that. You're in Dallas where you're kind of at the center of this new movement of academy players, of young players getting pushed, getting opportunities. And now we see getting sold as well over to some of these big leagues. But you came through a different style. You came through the draft. Um, I don't believe you played in an MLS academy of any sort or, you know, the DA coming through as, as a young player. What do you make of your path and how players like you and John Nelson and, and Ima Tumwasi and Jimmy Maurer, you know, guys who are getting it done in a different way than the Peppies and the Paxtons and the Justin Chase? Yeah, I, um, I really, and it's great. Yeah, even all the, the guys, the draft guys that you compared, we all have different paths within right. the draft too, which is crazy how uh, widespread it is. But um, yeah, I never played academy um, and even – throughout college and then a little bit afterwards like after connecticut even into seattle i was always like eh, i don't love my story that much um it's okay i've just been kind of grinding most of the time i've never had like super good connections my parents weren't uh, incredibly adept in the soccer world and knowing what's the right teams or they could never really actually even take me to training so it was most of the time it was my coaches so i played a lot for local teams um it's, i couldn't make the hour and a half drive to sort of a Jersey Queens to play with the Red Bulls or any other academy like that. Um, so yeah, I just went the, the usual route. Um, I think it's, it's whatever's, whatever's best or whatever situation you're in, actually, it might not even be what's best. Um, it's very likely that an academy situation could be what's best for the person, but it's not the situation that you're in. So you still have to make it work another way. Uh, I, yeah, I think if everyone were to be, put into La Masia Academy and were brought up that way with that coaching, I think it'd be quite beneficial for everyone, of course. Um, but that's just not how it is. So sometimes, yeah, guys, you end up playing club soccer and high school soccer and then you go to college and then you just kind of grind your way into the pros. And then if you can go from there, you go from there. And that's kind of what I'm, I'm trying to do. I, I like the idea now of my story because it's different. It's not the the usual. Mm -hmm. Other people like hearing it. Um, for me, it's just what I've been living, so it's cool. But other people actually do like hearing the story and talking about it. So I'm glad that um, other people, younger or older, can get can get a good message out of it and actually do like hearing it because it's it's something different. That's not exactly the norm. Um, so there are outliers out there that can make it. I'll tell you, as a broadcaster, it used to be exciting when someone was a young academy signing. It was unique. Now it's like, oh well. They're 22. They've been at the same club for six, seven, <laughs> eight years. And this is, and then everyone yeah. else does it as well. And so now you are the story. You're, you're the interesting one. Yeah. I guess, oh, okay. I guess that does make sense. I never even <laughs> thought about it like that. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your family back in New York where I'm from as well. So shout out New yes. York. It's unfortunately the greatest city in the world, which you can debate me on, but it's a losing debate. Know, that's, so it's that's always, fair. I haven't yeah. been. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. You, well, I, I'll tell you when you come back, it's changed. But I think it's it's changed some in some ways for the good, uh, as I guess the whole world has over the last two years. But I want to ask you <laughs> to some extent. Yeah. yeah, right. A lot of negative, a lot of shit, a lot of bad stuff. But um, you can sit outside now. So that, that's always a positive. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about your family, because uh, for a lot of people that have maybe seen you in passing so far in this first season of you playing, you step out on the field and you have the name Tafari on the back of your jersey, but sometimes in lineups and stats and graphics, it says a different name. Uh, I wanted you to maybe take people through your experience of of this decision you made, of why, and maybe for some people that are also juggling with this same type of decision, uh, what your process was. Yeah, it was a, a name that I've been quite very well aware of. It's just the name that was uh, my father's and then maybe his grandfathers or prior but essentially if we do trace the history back it is the reason why i don't want to use the name um because it yeah it, it is a slave name from however long or from everywhere i don't actually know but it's not a name that is necessarily positively associated with myself or my family um it is what is on my my bills and my government id and other things of that nature but uh, in terms of representing myself and 
having my career, I built this all off my own back, my own two feet. It wasn't, uh, and if, since I am allowed to wear a name on my jersey, I never had done so in club soccer or high school or even in college. It was never a, an actual issue. But now that I can wear a name on my jersey, I, I hadn't decided if I wanted to be my first or my middle um, at the time. But uh, as I was going through it and I knew I was coming to my second season, I hadn't played in my first, but I was anticipating and certainly striving to play. I wanted to get the name right, get a new number, um, and get everything to how I, I wanted and felt comfortable and to where it was at least my choosing. Um, it was similar to my number, not as historically significant, um, but my number was just given to me, and I was like, ah, I don't really want this number. I'd rather have something else. Um, so, I mean, yeah, if someone else is thinking about it or wanting to do the same thing, is just do whatever makes you feel comfortable. Everyone has that notion of look good, play good. Um, or feel good, play good, whatever it is, whatever can help you perform at your highest in any field that you're in sports or, or not, or in the office, uh, in the workplace, whatever it is you do, whatever makes you feel comfortable. I think you do have to strive for that option so you can perform. It's interesting. We've talked a lot about identity and feeling comfortable over the last few years in a lot of different ways when you talk about gender and and name and, and career and whatever you want to do. It's interesting to hear for you how that affects your everyday life and the way you play. Yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, just something that if I if I had the choice and the the preference um, that I wanted it kind of how I wanted it, and that's nothing against anyone else. Or, but if I'm going to be the one carrying out the task, I'd rather do it with the name of my choosing, and certainly so I could carry it out the best of my ability. So then that makes just everybody happy. Uh, and I believe Tafari is one who inspires awe. Is that correct? Yes. He who inspires awe. Um, not a bad name to go with. Not too bad. Yeah, I can, I can thank my, my mom and dad for that one. It's, it's got some power to it. Nice. Uh, well, you've had some power to your game. It's been really fun to watch you do your thing uh, in Kosi. I appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, I wanted to close you out on one interesting story, weird story. Um, you saved someone's life last year. That's not something you see on a, <laughs> on a soccer roster notes every once in a while. Yeah, I, um, I did. I was in the mall and there was, there was a lady choking there in the food court area, kind of sort of, she was outside of where she was working. Um, and then yeah, I, had, I had seen her choking. I thought there was one gentleman going up to where I thought he was going to give her the Heimlich. I was like, okay, fair enough. He's going to give her the Heimlich. He knows what he's about to do. This is what should be happening. We're all right. Um, but then I think he just started asking her questions. But she certainly couldn't talk at the time. And I was like, all right, this guy's really not doing anything. I, I, have, to, I, have, to, I have to give this woman the Heimlich right now. Um, so, yeah, I got up. Well, I walked on over and, like, didn't even take that many for us actually just just one and then like the food had come out and it was pretty yeah it was pretty crazy it was definitely a lot crazy for her um i was just in there like wow this woman needs the heimlich someone please give her the heimlich right now um, but no one else did so then i did and she was very obviously very very fortunate to, of it and i still keep in touch with her to this day actually i was gonna say that's sort of a relationship where do you go from there yeah, yeah, she was she was very very thankful. Um, and then like yeah, we we exchange numbers and we text every so often. I've invited her out to a couple games um, and such, and she's invited me back to the mall to just come visit um, at where she was working. So, but yeah, it's, it's super cool. She was uh, very very kind, very gracious about it. Well, you want him on your back line. You want him on the ball building out of the back, and you definitely want him around in case something bad happens because. He's a lot calmer than everyone else. And Kosi Tafari, center back for FC Dallas. Thanks for taking the time uh, in Kosi and joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a wonderful conversation. Um, always enjoyable. Always. Thank you. Well, we'll have to have you back when you win uh, MLS Cup. How about that? Oh, gladly. 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 <laughs>